<coughs> the undergang armchair. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Episode 7. We have reached another milestone. Not that it's 7 episodes, but that we slash I got butt hurt over the weekend over the podcast. Isn't that exciting? Uh, first time I've really uh, been butt hurt about it. Uh, I know that's maybe not a normal milestone to have, but um, it signifies the thickening of my skin about this. Uh, what happened was I was at a art opening. I was brushed off by someone who did not give a flying fuck about our podcast. And that makes perfect sense. But uh, it was at that moment. No, actually, it was much later. But it was at that moment I started to feel bad. And I realized it's because I haven't developed a thick skin about this yet. I am part of something that's being put out into the world. Once it's out there, I can do nothing about it. No one can. And, um, you know, you can tell me my personal artwork sucks all you want. I've developed a skin about that a long time ago. But uh, apparently you start over when you try something new. So uh, who knew I was a sensitive little baby about this? Uh, but the it, it's happened. It's happening. The uh, skin is thickening. And um, the podcast's first milestone of butt hurt has arrived. So um, I'm a little proud. I think the episode, you know, kind of related to that, this episode's about what it means to be true to yourself. I was thinking about that a lot today as I was getting ready for this uh, recording. And I kind of realized, what the hell does it mean to be true to yourself? I mean, I understand people tell you that all the time, but if I'm to be true to myself as the host of our program, what does that mean? I listened to Bill Burr's excellent podcast today, which means he's in my head, which means for some reason I want to speak in a Boston accent and, you know, say a bunch of bad words and, you know, talk shit to people. And that's part of me. I think that's funny. I like that, but I'm not sure that's all of me. So being true to myself is, I don't know, doing that if I feel like it doesn't really make sense. I also like being thoughtful and introspective and um, hopefully saying some intelligent things. So I don't know. I think we're just going to have to take this episode by episode, really. Uh, I will refrain from using the word cunt, I hope, uh, after listening to Bill's podcast, which I do heartily recommend. Uh, for you Danes, he is coming to town the 11th of December at the Bremen Theater here in Copenhagen. I'm going to be there. Never seen a comedy show before. I'm excited. That is my personal recommendation from me to you. Bill Burr at Bremen Theater, 11th of December, I do believe. Uh, he also has an excellent podcast called the Monday, Monday Morning Podcast. It's good. Listen to it. And uh, you can kind of vicariously live through the fact that he talks schmack about everybody. From his parents to his girlfriend to uh, some random French guy on the plane to himself, especially himself. So uh, I certainly live vicariously through that and uh, general hilarity ensues. But really what we're talking about today is uh, Copenhagen slash Denmark has, has gone through a loss lately. Uh, we lost our good friend Joseph Griffiths. Griffiths. It's a hard one, isn't it? Griffiths. Joseph Griffiths. Griffiths. Woo. We lost our friend Joseph. He, uh, I mean, you know, don't get all twisted up here. He is not dead. He just moved away. He moved back to Australia yesterday, Monday. Joseph lived here for almost a year. And uh, I had the honor of working with him. And I also had the honor of sitting down and interviewing him. He's a talented artist. He's an up-and-comer. But what I appreciated the most was his um, incredible thoughtfulness. Um, we have a really good talk. Uh, when we were working together, we had a lot of fun. He wasn't a heavy dude. But when you start 
kind of discussing ideas with him, he just turns out to be one of the most thoughtful dudes around. And I think that really shows in this interview. So I'm kind of proud of our talk. I think it's good. I really appreciate the way the man's mind works. And I'm sad to say that he has moved back to Australia. Big stuff is going on, though. He's, uh, you know, going to be part of the Sydney Biennial and all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, I hope we planted an idea in his head that he's going to come back. He certainly enjoyed his time here. Him and uh, his lady, Jenny, will be much missed. So, yeah, I, uh, I hope you guys enjoy the interview with our friend Joseph from Australia. And if you didn't get to meet him, don't worry. You can still see an artwork of his in, uh, here in Denmark, in Espia. We'll get to that. I'll have links, the whole shebang. In the meantime... Let's do this. Let's talk to Joseph. Instead of starting with where you come from in Australia, we've been talking about that for a while. Mm. Let's start about Denmark. Okay. Um, I found it interesting that you guys just kind of showed up here and jumped in, you and your girlfriend. We're just like, okay, we're here. It's on now. Um, because in my experience, most immigrants who come here, I don't mean immigrants, most people who visit and come and try to work or uh, go to school or something, find it quite jarring. They have a lot of like trouble coming into it. What was your experience like landing here and like just, what was your idea before you came and what was it like after you came? Not sure what my idea was before I came. Uh, Did you think I'm about not sure, Denmark I'm not as a sure country? it was very um, formulated, to be honest. I mean, I've been here once for five days, um, so I kind of knew basically what the inner city area looked like hmm. around Copenhagen. Um, well, it helps you had a picture in your head. Yeah, definitely. Um, and... Um, a, a close friend of mine from my time in high school uh, has lived here for the past few years. So that um, that ended up uh, being quite important, I guess. Um, it def- definitely put us in touch with a network of people um, straight away. Tell you um, how things worked, etc. I'd also, um, last time I was here, that was brief, had met with these, uh, with uh, N55, the art collective based in Christianshavn. Um, because I was very interested in some projects that they were doing that kind of mixed together art and architecture and urban urban occupation in a way that was neither um, kind of authorized uh, but, but but wasn't overly antagonistic either in that kind of uh, activist sort of way. It was just like really cool. interesting projects what do they that do? engaged the ideas of how we used urban spaces. Okay. And I was interested in vernacular architecture and that sort of thing you know like uh we'd been traveling a lot when we came here and i'd been really getting off on like neolithic buildings and um all kinds of old stone buildings in the south of france and different kinds of um ways that you could see you could trace how people had lived in other times Uh um, and maybe what their kind of styles were like and the kind of visual identity of the people was somehow in the buildings i was interested in all that and then i came to copenhagen these guys were making houses that walked with robotic legs and um, houses which floated and thought about different ways of occupying uh, urban space or taking it for yourself reclaiming it for yourself in zones that were kind of you know nomadic or had a sort of element of something more ancient um, that weren't it weren't kind of carefully controlled already by legislation and that's one of the biggest problems in like australia is that um and and i dare say in the states is that things are so heavily regulated and so there's such a wariness about the legal implication of taking risks that most um businesses and institutions and things just simply aren't willing to uh, to to take risks and, and you don't feel that here as much no i don't I mean because that's the that's the whole beef with so-called socialist countries is that everything's overregulated. yeah look but, um maybe i also i'm not in a position to see it for what it is um but i i definitely think that um 
what I have seen is that like they're, they're more willing to test things oh, I agree. Um, and they've got a pragmatic kind of approach to, um, to, to difference or to change. Um, well, I think here there's a willingness to put money into attempts yeah, without definitely. proving that anything could work or happen. Well, well, I think that that's the strategy, isn't it? And that, I think that that's something which we should learn from. I mean, yeah, certainly in Australia, um, political bodies don't take risks and that sort of thing. And they, they, we haven't seen too many examples of, certainly not with when it comes to urban space usage and stuff, right. um, beyond superficial kind of pop-up, uh, sure, sure. you know, urban in space things. perhaps. Um, but like in terms of like, you know, saying, all right, maybe it's a good idea if um, people had collective ownership over their apartment building right. um, rather than have to pay these extreme mortgages. Maybe the, maybe we'll test that in one suburb for a set amount of time and see how it goes or we'll give, it, we'll give that right to one building and just test it. And but I think that stuff happened organically here. Quite possibly. I, don't it's think just, the I find it kind of inspirational. Yeah. The fact that there's some willingness at least to... Um, I just don't understand how they avoid the rhetoric because let's take America, for example. Perhaps if you wanted to use to throw tax money at a project which may very well fail, a walking house, for example, that's a great example, a walking house, you are, as soon as there's any sort of media or public eye shined upon this, going to face a howling storm a shit storm, if I may, mm. of people be yelling about misappropriation of public money. Mm. And like, I, I don't understand how they avoid that debate here. And I understand there are some voices who say that, but there seems to be a general consensus. It's money well spent to a degree. There's a lot of debate here. There's a lot of talking back and forth. They're very earnest. But in the U.S., it would collapse under the weight of the shit storm it created. Mm. Uh, I mean... I think, uh, yeah, it's very difficult, you know, not really being a, um, a Danish speaker to understand the subtleties of the, the interface between the, the state and the politician, political structure and the media mm. and how that plays off. I mean, I can't really say anything about that. But I think um, when I first got here and, and something that seems to have stayed with me um, was that a few people told me that the the, uh, the way they described their thoughts about politics and about Denmark as a nation uh, reflected like a real separation, like a psychological or philosophical separation between the government and then the state itself. Mm. Um, I suppose meaning the public service um, mm -hmm. or those people who kind of are the so-called machine of the country. Right. Um, and that made that I, 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 that impressed me in a way, <clears throat> because uh, most of the most of the uh, I think reasoning behind um, certainly behind political parties being unwilling to try things out is that they don't want to risk votes, um, and mm. there's very little separation in Australia, if any, between an idea of the the state as a working entity that's separate from the government, you know, that if you can imagine that the, that the country's a, you know, a large, <laughs> a large whaling vessel or something, and, right. and the government just happened to be the crew captaining it for that short period of time, I don't think that we separate that like that. And I think it's actually very useful to think about the government and the state as separate, even if it's, even if it's a leap of faith in a way. That makes because, a lot of sense. Because the idea that, you know, uh, that, that a country can be kind of something you could be proud of and believe in without believing in the people running it, mm. or that uh, perhaps that the people running it aren't as consequential to the greater scheme mm. as they may make themselves seem or the media make them seem. And, you know, I mean, that makes sense because the way that legislation changes is quite small and incremental and governments make huge hoo-hahs when they, you know, change like very small uh, details from the, from the constitution or from, right. from, from any kind of law. And, and, and I think that, you know, on the whole, countries are sort of running on their own a little bit. You know, they're still going to, they're still going to get from A to B somehow. Um, it's just, it's just how, how far off course they're steered perhaps. And, um, and, and I think it's 
probably worth like uh, you know younger countries uh, considering that. Um, that because, there's an entity that exists well, outside of the elected officials. Definitely, and I mean Australia has a, a, a pretty strong identity complex. I think you know, and um, you know, being you know uh, having a very small population. I mean, I can only really talk about the cultural areas, but you know, you know, I've got a huge history of anybody who's sort of seriously involved in a career in in the in the cultural fields, whether it be visual arts or music or theatre, or film or anything, all go to Europe or the States or somewhere else. You know, anyone who's kind of serious have have traditionally. I mean, I'm talking for the last, well, probably hundred years, but let's say fifty. Um, that's been a massive. Um, certainly since the sort of advent of like easy plane travel right. people people just flee you know because there's not enough and they don't come of, back or what uh, some do some don't most probably maintain some connection and all that sort of stuff but i think the point is that um a lot of the kind of cultural production that um gives people something to be proud of comes in some ways from being together Mm-hmm. Um, and if people keep leaving, uh, you know, then it's hard for for that kind of um, this, that sort of the cultural sense of the identity to grow because the political sense, you know, the, the sense of identity or the idea of a state that's separate from the government, I think, has to do with believing that you've even got a nation. You know, we've had such kind of, uh, you know, our 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 kind of recent, you know, racial history and uh, and all that kind of thing is 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 etched pretty close to the surface for us, you know, like I think right. even if most people don't think about it like that, I think that there's been some reasons for, for that it's been difficult for us to, um, to really band together and have some, and kind of take some pride. Um, and nationalism is very unpopular and, and for good reason in many cases, but, but, um, where yeah. in, in, in Denmark or in Australia? Globally, I think, you know, is, you know, post, well, post World well, War America, II. It's kind of popular. <laughs> well, I, it is popular in America, but it's, uh, I think that's, that it's might be a bag to be honest, but, but I think that might be a, a bit of an anomaly. I mean, I, I don't know that it's very popular elsewhere. I've been right. Right. Um, I mean, certainly you know, uh, the intellectual shamed, elite shamed more. all tend to like, uh, you know, like to rag on their countries right. a lot of the time because they right. see the problems and they're critical and they think about the world. But um, I think Australia's got a lot to be proud of. And I think, you know, certainly with this very, glo- I mean, we're a great example, for example, of a global country. And I mean, you know, for, you know we've got a very good, um, at least in the cities, a very good balance of... Uh, representation from from around the world people of all nationalities and and those cultures are actually starting to take hold and develop their own communities in a really good way not in you know sometimes obviously there's problems but um as but, everywhere but the the culture is getting enriched very immediately by the immigration to the country uh the migration but, to the country let me ask you this because you have on several occasions told me that that australia has some sort of minority complex you know yeah and i'm wondering do you think it's kind of unfounded in a way because it seems like you know okay take a country like denmark everyone knows where australia is everyone has a picture in their head if you say australia they imagine something be it something as cheesy as kangaroos and ayers rock which i know isn't called that anymore um you know put a shrimp on the barbie whatever yeah, totally yeah, generic see. bullshit you want to say but if you name a country like Denmark they won't necessarily have a picture in their head uh, and Danes do have a minority complex too but you've mentioned this several times I mean when you mm. grew up in Australia did you feel like oh this is a second rate country uh, no nah, not really no nah. I, I think um, the minority complex uh, it's a it's a it's I think it comes partly from from being, uh, you know, from being a small population in some ways, and always looking to somewhere else for our lead. You mm. know, people haven't really. Uh, I think, I, yeah, it's it's difficult to generalize, which I, I don't usually have trouble with. But since we're recording this, I kind of want to do it <laughs> <Right>. justice. I mean, <laughs> I got you. I mean, the minority complex I think uh, arises mostly in political situations and in terms of global politics. Mm-hmm. Um, and sadly, um, 
we haven't shown enough leadership thus far in terms of our own ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, our, our culture is very dominated by um, capital. So we tend to go where will serve us best economically. As more, most countries are. Yeah, more than anything else. And that's a bit of a shame in my view. I feel like I kind of just came up with this on the spot, but maybe it's true. I feel like the countries which have historically been in the shadows, the Western countries, like Denmark, or I, I hesitate to say Australia, but kind of somewhat along the lines of Australia, Sweden, um, I don't know, Luxembourg, <laughs> wherever. Uh, like it's kind of their hour to shine now. Like the big cultural powerhouses you know, like America, for example, is kind of losing their edge. You know, if like if you look at at like most desirable cities to live in and, and general happiness indexes and all that stuff, it seems to be shifting away from mm. from the world leaders of the nineties, you know. Yeah, but I think uh I mean like you said the I the, think the critical mass is important. Yeah. You know, um but it's coming. I feel like it's coming. Maybe. Uh, there was a really interesting project, uh, uh, artistic project set up by um, Kevin Murray, an uh, Australian um, specialist and academic in the craft area, but also in, in the visual arts more broadly, who set up a very interesting project that was about creating strong cultural links between countries of the Southern Hemisphere. Hmm. Um, particularly in the southern countries of Africa, South America, Australia, New Zealand, um, some of the Pacific Islands, and uh, etc. Uh, and it was extremely uh, interesting to me when I first encountered it, and I, I knew him and um, volunteered for it uh, at one point. Um, the idea of Australia, this huge floating mass in the south of everywhere that just feels remote from anywhere, being part of a collective was quite a cool idea. I thought it was just a nice conceptual leap to make. And perhaps, you know, I can I could see something similar being useful in Scandinavia. I know it already kind of is economically and politically that they have certain treaties and things which apply to them and which where, where they kind of um, co-support one another or... In, you know, at least in some ways. They have a relationship with each other. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that that's... Uh, I, I, I mean, I think that the main reason that um, Paris, London, New York uh, have been such important cultural centers is just because they're, they're massive, you know? Mm. Um, and from my experience, if, if you're living in a city of, you know, 10 million people and 1% of the population are interested in what you're into, that's, that's quite a lot of people. <laughs> Sure, but, you know, um, and that means that you have the possibility for a, a kind of level of critical discourse and a level of engagement and a level of, you know, you've got a big enough niche market also to sustain a kind of economy around around your niche interests. So if it's the yeah. art world, like let's, as we're saying, um, that, I mean, I agree in one hand that, you know, um, that these cultural centers are in the global age forced to look abroad, certainly to Asia and to the developing world because those, those are very high contrast, the kind of work that's coming out from those places. Mm-hmm. But even the more um, culturally close uh, countries like uh, the Scandinavian countries or Australia and New Zealand, um, perhaps even uh, Eastern European countries to some extent, um, that that while they'll be uh, looked to for kind of uh, new energy perhaps as um, as the big cities. I mean, they're so microcosmic. New York is just a world in unto itself, you know, and you can, like, it feels, I mean, I, I mean I've only been to New York once for four weeks, right, and, and I still, you know, can kind of recite, you know, the different neighborhoods just of Manhattan, and then I know all of these different little art collectives and things that I've never visited that have popped up all over, like Brooklyn, and, you know, I, I've got this kind of whole accidental knowledge about the New York art scene, which it just has zero to do with my life. Um, and it's just because there's this critical mass that is projecting and has a sort of, it has a, it has a kind of, um, that's a historical thing though, too. Well, it, there's an engine room for, right. for saying, Hey, this is what we're doing. We're right. doing this. Hey, everyone, this is what we're doing. Right. And, they, and they've attracted, you know, important artists from all over the world. So you get really rich work coming out. 
Um, but you also have this incredible industry that supports that because even though it's still a marginal interest, say, in terms of the actual cultural production, um, it's sustainable in that little microcosmic way. And right. I, I don't see that really disappearing. Things can go in and out of favour maybe, you know, things become overly commercialised. I think you know, I've heard a lot of people talking about um, the demise of the Chelsea art scene or whatever and, you know, that everyone moved to Brooklyn or something, you know, I mean... Right, right, and it's too expensive. You know, yeah. and, and of course these sorts of waves happen, but basically you've got a big massive engine um, yeah, which speaking drives... Speaking of a ship with a crew, you know, like that's the kind of thing, it floats on its own and whoever happens to be scrabbled to the top of the, you know, at the crow's nest pointing the ship in some direction is doing something, but it runs mm. on its own. Yeah, but... I don't know, it feels very impenetrable to me. It's also a long way away from, from anywhere I've lived in the recent time, so it's... It feels impenetrable to I me, don't, too. I don't know. I, don't, I find it all very intimidating, or I don't mean that in a negative way, just um, almost uninteresting because it's so large and of its own. Um, right. But the, 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 the really interesting thing is, is what's happening on, you know, what, what individuals are making in that environment. And I think that if you can pull it off, that being part of an artistic community on that scale must be incredibly rewarding and incredibly uh, um, invigorating and push your practice really, really quickly. And uh, I mean, on one hand, I'm kind of envious of that, but... Um, did you get the feeling, like I did, that New York has destroyed better men than I? When I was there, I felt like... I like the it would, <laughs> I mean, I just felt like, you know, oh, I'd like to live here, but it would destroy me. There's been, I, I can't it, handle this. I'm not old enough to handle this. It's been a very popular um, destination for all the uh, trendy young people from Melbourne to go there and try and, I don't know if they think they're going to make it or at least try and conquer it in some sort of way. It's like, and it seems almost like, even though a lot of the time it's obviously based in... Um, it's just know, survival, right? The same, mean, well, it's the same old thing about, you know, trying to make a career somewhere and get no noticed and... And maybe make a make a splash in a bigger pond, and I understand all of that. Well, the opportunities are people. large too. Yeah, they are, but I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of loud voices to compete with, and sure. and, and and some and some of the most the but best the qualified voices as well. Right. Although I have heard some pretty funny stories that kind of demystify the level of qualifications that you might associate <laughs> with the people there, you know, that, you know, but, but, but I isn't think, that the art world in general? You know, once you peel the facade back, people are running around, you know, kind of half know what they're doing half the time. And yeah, probably. I feel like as, as I get older and see more of the, the, the way things work, I think language has a lot to do with that. I mean, presentation. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of the market or the world, the art world, in that sense, yeah, of course, there's a lot of presentation. But um, even in in um, criticism and um, and the academic sort of uh, circle um, around the actual process of making things or hmm. creating situations. It's hard to be good at anything you do. Then there's there's a, there's a kind of there's just a disconnect that happens between um, what seems to be going through most artists' heads and how they work and the kind of methods and strategies they employ to communicate and make work um, is often. Um, you know, not as closely linked to a kind of literal linguistic understanding as what, um, you know, art history and, and, and the history of, of art criticism would like. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not that they're unaware of that, not that the critics, the critics know that, but um, it's just that at the end, you know, um, it feels like there's a facade on art practice because it's always filtered through this language machine and this sort of that's um, international that's, arts English. Yeah, and then that's just that's just a problem. I mean, you it's know, a huge problem. I mean, people just should look, go to museums and galleries and any kind of grassroots events or anywhere you can see something being made I think and that's see it really in the funny. flesh and think for yourself about what it might mean. And sure, inform yourself, read criticism, read art history, but. 
but you have to stand in front of the thing and and feel it right you know, I it think, doesn't inform the whole debate um or talk to the artists themselves if you can you know i think right. that's a, and I, I think that's what you're trying to kind of do in a way so I think have that's you heard also the useful. uh have you heard the uh, saying that um art criticism or criticism in general is the intellectual's revenge on the artist i haven't heard the saying seems pretty uh cynical it's, it's heavy-handed but in a way it's kind of like oh uh, yeah you know because like a lot of artists don't necessarily think along the lines of the current arts discussion current or anytime you know perhaps you make art because you don't have anything else you can do or even more you do it because you can't control it or it's completely thoughtless you know it's not allowed to be meaningless art is not allowed to just exist on its own but my, it my, seems. my comment would be that it's even if I mean many artists will say I mean you know, and, and historically this is on record you know like Jasper Johns and many other people have been made really significant contributions to the critical direction and the critical engagement with art in an intellectual way mm. they've been interpreted in that way you know it all you know many have said that then that's you you can read that if you want and that's not really what i'm going for right but i mean i also think that that is uh you know that's that's also a little bit tongue-in-cheek i think what that really means in many cases isn't that i'm an artist i'm not engaged with intellectual uh discourse or I'm not necessarily trying to orient my work in a larger cultural framework. I'm just making stuff. Right. But I think what that actually means is I'm absorbing everything. I'm filtering everything. I'm thinking about everything. and Every decision is made deliberately. Mm -hmm. But if I could write that down, I wouldn't be painting. Right. Or I wouldn't be doing whatever else I'm doing. Right. And that's not my mode. That's an interesting way of putting it. You know, and so it's all going in and I'm making all these relationships and I don't, I can't understand what they all are all of the time. And sometimes, you know, you look, I mean, when I look at drawings and things I made when I was in art school or whatever, and which is getting on 10 years ago. And I'm like, I'm decoding things about myself from that time that I could never understand or articulate at that time. Mm. Um, but didn't you meet when you were in art school the people who couldn't articulate it even if they tried? They couldn't even bullshit it? You know, because for me, when I went to art school, it was very important that you could decode your own work and present it, un uh, open it up a little bit and present a package because the debate had to go upon your intention. You were never allowed to present a work and just leave the room and have everyone debate about it or anything like that. You had to unpack it a little bit. I think it's uh, important to take responsibility for what you do. Sure. I know that's not really what you're asking, but I think that's the most crucial point in that room. But it just seems like ta people who had talent and had heart couldn't always function in the, okay, let's say art school is a mirror, a small skewed mirror for the art world at large. They couldn't function in that format, you know, they couldn't really, they got, they got shit on because there's the kids who could talk the talk, yeah. but couldn't walk the walk and vice versa. And, 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 you know, they were always at odds with each other. I definitely think it helps you in any aspect of the art world if you can articulate um, what you're trying to do in some way. Um, and usually the simplest way is the best, uh, in my opinion, because you're going to be able to be understood by the most people, basically. Mm. Um, well, there's a problem all with all the great minds I've met or even read can, you know, don't need a lot of complicated uh, kind of reference points to be able to say something very clear but very deep. Mm. Um, what do you think about the current state of art right now in terms of that? Do you have to have a somewhat convoluted point or are you able to simply express an idea i mean it's a good question i uh, um i'm quite happy with with everything i mean i'm quite happy with sunday painters who just paint vases of flowers to be honest mm. i mean i don't i don't i don't think that 
I'm not sure that the kind of value systems that we've got uh, for art are very relevant to mm. to artists. Um, what I do think is important increasingly is a level of critical engagement with what you're doing. I think that you need to be able to understand the... Um, On a personal level. Uh, yeah, with your own work. I think right. you need to be able to understand how what you make is affected by and feeds into what's come before you and because you're just going to make better work if you're if you're aware but you know and to be aware of the kind of at least the core writing about illusionism if it i mean if, you, if you're sitting around making uh photographic drawings like i've spent a lot of my time doing and you don't know you know about art and illusion or any of the kind of key essays about these kinds of ideas, then um, there's a chance that your work comes off a little naive because there's going to be a lot of the audience members who who, who do have that and, and trompe l'oeil is just not really that interesting to them. Right. But on the other hand, um, whatever you're doing, and I think this is the key point, that When you're inside of that, when you're listening and reading to, reading, listening to and reading, um, writing about art, essays about art, philosophy of art, then there's a very good chance that the work you make is going to be about art too. Right. And if that's all it's about, then your ability to reach and move people who are from other walks of life is limited. Right. And I think that um while i think i think that there's just a natural kind of um whirlpool that happens in any field where um the academe and the criticism and the theorizing around a subject sucks to the center those artists who whose work feeds into the kind of academic critical discourse most easily because it can be uh, it can be written about, it can be talked about, and those artists become popular. I think it makes a lot of quite sense. Quite a lot, but I think there's many cases of artists who are who are doing things which are, or who have done at least, um, which is which are important uh, engagements with that that history of art, and they think about. Um, you know, aesthetic and uh, formal and conceptual developments from previous movements, but they also are able to execute themselves in a way that's succinct enough mm-hmm. and has some universal elements enough to engage people from on a number of levels and from all kinds of works of life. And, I, and to my mind, that's the ultimate thing to strive for, something which is... Both forward-looking and backwards-looking. Well... As, or at as, least relevant... Equally relevant to to the to a to a general public and a so-called informed art public. I think that's a great goal to have. I mean, everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. I um, I struggled on a couple of like, for me, I have a really hard time with the criticism versus accessibility uh, issue. For me, you know, in my normal mode of being and my job, I see art every day. And it, I will not hesitate to look at something and be like, this is terrible. I don't want anything to do with this. But at the same time, in my heart, I'm like, this person should do this. I really want them to enjoy doing this. Art is accessible for everyone. You know, and so part of me is like very judgmental. The other part's like, good for you. You know, and like I kind of struggle with this, this issue. And I think regardless of how I feel about it, the bigger issue is that art is becoming a bit inaccessible to your average person. I feel like. I feel like the accessible to people making it, or to people no, who want to make it, the general public, or people who people view who, it, people who view it, uh, because the debate is becoming more and more insular, and more and more closed off, and more and more self-referential to a point in which, you know, like the example that really struck me was when I was in art school. I'd been there for two years, and I had a good friend from California visiting me in Chicago, where I was going to school, and I went to the art institute. They have a big museum there. And uh, I had to work one day or something, so my roommate took my friend to the museum. And she essentially walked in there going, I don't like art, 
and left going, wow, that was really interesting because my roommate took her around and was like, okay, this is what this person was trying to do. This is what's going on here. This is how this relates to the other things and contextualized things for her. Mm-hmm. And she found it very interesting. But before that, when she just walked up to it, it didn't say much to her. I think that's interesting. I mean, there's a lot being written and said about, you know, whether or not, uh, I mean, even in the sort of purest forms of psycho psychology and things about whether art is code totally. or whether art is a code. Um, and it seems there's some consensus. Um, this is very secondhand what I'm telling you, so I couldn't tell you from source material if it's true. It's not my interpretation. But I've heard people say that, um, <clears throat> you know, respected scholars um, say that it's it's generally not understood that way um, in, in psychological terms. I can't uh, explain exactly why. How is it understood but, then? Uh, my thinking is that... Uh, it's about specific, specificity. <laughs> specificity? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's about uh, narrowing things. Uh, you know, um, it's about that whirlpool. That right. If you're having a conversation like we're having one uh, and everybody is very informed about a subject, you can just keep mining deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Right. I think that that is, I mean, that's what scholarship's all about. Um, we should be promoting a level of thinking which, you know, is is very detailed and which you know which makes it naturally <coughs> interrogates also. interrogates the subjects. Yeah, but I mean, to someone who's not initiated into the discussion or the topics or the given points. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's there's a big gap. I mean, my my uncle sent me a, a couple of days ago uh, a joke email. Uh, you know that was basically an online quiz to detect whether or not a painting had been made by a toddler or by a modern artist, you know. <laughs> and I mean, you know, nine out of ten paintings were de Koonings, right. you know, and he told me that he got them all wrong, you know. And I mean, I mean these, are, these are, to most uh, people who grew up uh, with, even in like high school art, you know, you'd have seen at least three or four of these de Koonings, you know. And I mean, he was, for the, you know, for, for many of the artists that I look up to, he was their idol, you know. Right. Um, and and has just been a huge fear. I mean, it's impossible to imagine that, right. you know, you know that he wouldn't be an important part of, you know, at least it's the last fifty natural, years yeah. of art history. You know, right. or in basic education. I mean, he's 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 just such a massive figure. But I mean, you've got to realize that that's 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 your mainstream angle. And right. so, do you try to? Uh, engage uh, people with uh, who can't recognize a de Kooning painting uh, do you try to engage them uh, in a long-winded lesson about the semantics of art history and art criticism right. or do you find a way to use those tools to to catch on to things which do relate to their everyday existence but you know that I mean but which may equally remind the scholars among us and the the art lovers among us of a bunch of uh you know key points of modernism for example or or may reference a certain kind of uh metaphysical writing or something that's been right. part of the cultural discourse i mean those things can be in the work at the same time that very simple things are in the work and i mean if the arts aren't about communicating basic things like love and life and death and all those primal things i mean and nature and 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 order and all that i mean the, these are these are core things right. you know the kind of language and discourse about um you know shifts in post minimalism are interesting to artists and 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 people who study art because they tell us something about how things were made before how other people have approached the problem of making new things how you make something new how you do something different etc but I mean, expecting everybody to go into a museum and realize that this thing, which now looks completely old hat, uh, it was like some kind of important revolution at the time and therefore they should value it, isn't the case. I mean, if it doesn't, some work was just off its time. It doesn't have right. to move everyone. And I don't think we have to be obsessed with, you know, trying to get people to catch up. Right. Well, that's but been my personal... We should just be better at communicating and bridging that gap. Right. Well, that's been my personal solution. I, after art school 
really kind of dropped out of art, at least on any sort of intellectual level. I went through the motions physically because I enjoyed being in the dark room. I enjoyed taking pictures, but I stopped looking into who was making art, what was about, what any sort of discussion there was. And I'm only coming back to it now because I felt alienated by it. Mm. I really felt like I like I've always had this issue about not exactly being a, a intellectual when it comes to art, but being very interested. Um, and I'm just coming back now on my own terms and saying, okay, you're never going to be as, as, as strong intellectually discussing art as the, as someone who does this all the time or has a job doing it or takes a great interest, but it doesn't mean you can't decode it in your own way, have your own relationship to it and enjoy a discussion about it. You know, obviously no more than your average person. So I feel like I'm stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. I've got you know, a connection to the completely unwilling you to know, know the language, but you don't, you don't really want to talk that much. Yeah. And I just don't really like see what it's good for. In a lot of cases, it seems like gobbledygook a lot of the time. Like I, I'm really, you know, Somerset Maugham, the author, yeah. his whole goal was to write as simply as possible. And I really enjoy that. Like you said, you also said that earlier, explaining an idea clearly, there's no reason to make it convoluted. Oh, oh. And that doesn't mean it doesn't have to be intelligent. You know, it's that fine balance between you can have it be extremely intelligent or specific, mm. but it doesn't have to be convoluted. Yeah. And the I feel like art's discussion has become convoluted. There can be, I mean, the only problem with making things which can be widely appreciated is that it can make them quite general at times. Sure. It can, can tend towards generality. Sure. Uh, and that doesn't work if you've got something very detailed or specific to say. Sure. Um, and... Uh, I think there's places for all of it. And I don't exactly. think that I don't think that people have to be. Uh, I I'm usually pretty happy if people look at what I do and ask the question: Is this art? Why is this art? Or all those questions are kind of um, as important tools and have been important tools throughout the last 150 years of kind of modernism through to whatever we have now. Uh, in shaping and, re and reshaping and allowing freedom in interpreting what we think is good, what we don't think is good, what moves us. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was only 150 years ago that if, if something wasn't perfectly rendered, then it was just unacceptable. Right. Um, now, you know, I mean, one of the most interesting thing you said before was that like you just stayed at it because you were making things. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's at the core I mean, I make art because I like making things. It's why I started. And even the most conceptually based practices um, seem to be driven still by a sort of, um, seem to be driven by a kind of a rhythm of process, mm -hmm. even if that process is, is a bit hands off. Absolutely. And I think that that rhythm of process, um, whether it's time in the studio painting or whether it's uh, uh, planning, whether it's uh, going to uh, manufacturing plants and seeing what different materials do or talking to a philosopher about uh, their recent PhD thesis or whatever it is that's, that's helping you get to where, you're, where you want to go mm -hmm. or that uh, at least tickles your fancy. Or not doing anything. You've got to follow maybe. the nose, you know, and, right. and, that's what, and that's what making things is doing, you know, because each time you're making these vast range of subtle decisions and subtle choices. And, I mean, there's a whole... You know, uh, I mean, I think that's 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 at the core. You know, the process is sort of, of of often spoken about in a way that tends to limit it to sort of uh, manual processes or right, physical right, right. physical work making. And I don't think that's relevant. I think that, but I, I think that it's the making that counts. And the reason you get John saying, you know, I just want to make paintings, kind of thing. It, I, I just that it, it's not really, you know, and, and this kind of trope that sort of this tongue in cheek artist saying. Oh, it's not really about anything. And, you know, right. I, I'm amazed. Coy smile, wink, wink. Yeah, and and <laughs> and I mean, sometimes it isn't about anything as it's described to the artist by the critic reviewing their work. Maybe all of the stuff that the critic said is completely interpretation. Right. But 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 that's what art's for. Right. Art's for stimulating different kinds of interpretations. Sure. Um, I think the problem lies in when uh, the execution of projects 
doesn't facilitate a, a kind of easy uh, an easy reading as well as a more detailed reading sure um, and I think that um, I shouldn't say easy that a direct reading as well as a, a more as, as well as a reading you might have to search for right um, and I think that yeah that there's a risk sometimes with um, the level of kind of criticism ac- and academe associated with the art world and the impetus on conceptually based practice that the artist forgets that they're also thinker and executor right at at the same time and judge and sometimes and, and sometimes the the execution um, suffers a little bit um, i think in the eyes of the artist to so as not to interfere with the purity of the concept right but in my view it's often that execution and finding the best way to transmit what you're trying to say not just one way not just a way that you think kind of might look good or that you think looks like other art you've seen or that you think doesn't look like art or whatever it is you're trying to go for right often it's the execution which brings in those people who and i'm not talking about any particular kind right but finding the Viewers best and- way to express what you're trying to express i think is as important as the message otherwise it doesn't get through a lot of the time well let's talk about this because you mentioned earlier that when you make a drawing and if it, if it raises the debate about whether it's art at all that that is a success that's a sign of success for you um vaguely that's what i understood at least um i, I find it i find it satisfying it's successful in the sense that it's encouraging people to ask ask questions for themselves about the world and right. about whether or not something fits into it. Uh, it's not about whether they like something I've made because I want to be proud of it and because I want them to think I'm a great artist, you know. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't say it's, you know, what I'm aiming for. But right. I think that it's, even if that's the sort of base response to things you do, that that's at least engaging people. It's a sign of some sort of success well, for you, the you, work. You, you're communicating with people. Right. Um, and so, I mean, we've seen sort of shock tactics and a lot of ugly stuff, but sure, you know, um, but let's take it a couple of steps back when like, I kind of want to steer this obviously around to being about you too. Um, where, like, what was it that drew you into making art, your own art in the first place? Uh, was there ever a conscious decision? Did you ever say, gee, I think I want to be an artist. And I mean that in the capital A sense. I want to try to make a living. I want to go to art school. I want to... Mm. Uh, I think I want to be an artist came quite a bit after art school. Um, Why'd you go to art school then? I kind of pursued art because um, because I enjoyed drawing, okay. essentially. Okay. You know, and it was something which... Uh, I was better than average at when I was a kid. Okay. I mean, very simply, like most artists probably, or a lot of people who get interested. Um, and I kept doing it. I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed the kind of solitariness of, and the kind of concentratedness of like... Did you also do it in, when you were in your teenage years? 14, yeah, 15, yeah. 16, 17 years old? Yeah, I did. Old? I always drew. Okay. Um... And I mean, that went through all kinds of cycles and fads sure, sure, and interests, sure. but I mean, yeah, it was always part of my life. And then um, in high school, I had some really, uh, I really didn't, you know, I had, high school was a funny time uh, in terms of how I related to a lot of my superiors and stuff, but I had some cool art teachers um, and uh is that code for you were you talked back and you didn't like your math teacher and you uh, put yeah. pins in her I, cushion? I, 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 had, I had, I was just an adolescent. Sure. I was just yeah, trying to work things neat. out. Yeah. Um, and trying to be an individual in a kind of environment that was about making you the same as everyone else, and, and right. it pissed me off. But but the, you found uh, solace in the art classes somehow. The art classes would yeah it was much freer. Hmm. Um, and I was encouraged because I could, I had at some basic aptitude for line and proportion and space. And I could do these sort of formal things that I'd been practicing since I was a kid, you know, 
quite by accident or without knowing really what I was doing. But it's also in my family. The idea of being an artist was not um, that foreign. Like right. it wasn't a big jump. When I, when I got to finishing uh, high school, I was like, yeah, I want to go to art school. And I didn't get into the art school I wanted to go to when I finished. And uh, went and tried some other stuff and did some traveling and did some other courses and worked um, pretty hard. And you know, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> right. Backbreaking um, work. Yeah, I mean, ah, it was good. It's, it's very good for you to to get your hands dirty. But um, no, I, 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 it stayed with me. I wanted to go to art school. And then when I left art school, I think I actually wanted to be a graphic designer. And that's kind of what I started doing. I was doing kind of commercially oriented, applying visuality. But yeah, I wasn't ready for thinking about it. Right. Um, in a more self-sufficient kind of a sense where the art just had to stand for its own sake. Right. Kind of like the idea of applying it or making things that were functional, which I still in some ways do, but uh, not so much in the, not so much to a commercial end. Um, and I realized there were so many great graphic designers out in the world that that was just not a, not a race I needed to run. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, it just became clear that uh did you make the a best conscious way to choice? Exercise. Yeah, I, I left Australia. Um, I, I got a grant actually uh, to go to Europe for twelve months, traveling and learning and doing mentorships and residencies and things. And that's. I great. mean, it wasn't specifically for that, but I kind of managed to design a project and and I got funded. Um, and that was um, up until that point. After art school, I've been working, you know, doing commercial art, and. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that was like, uh, I was planning to take my laptop with me, you know, and do client work on the side and all that <laughs> sort of stuff while I was traveling around to make some money and stuff. And uh, and, and my wonderful girlfriend was just like, you got this money to to do what you want to do. Like, don't waste your time doing that. Don't fly to Paris and do And I'm like, but what about all my clients? And I mean, we're talking about who cares stuff, you know. Right, right, but, right. <clears throat> um, anyway, so I was like, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do... Uh, Probably a really good for a decision while. right there. And um, it was a hard one because I actually had to face up to it. Right. Know? I had to actually confront it in a way that it wasn't something that I wished I was doing more of but that I didn't really have time to do. And so right, whenever right, I got right. a chance, I'd do something. Right. I had to start to you own to face it. face it. That's, that's, I think that's when I sort of, I would say that's when my work started to be a bit more accountable and when was this approximately? About 2010. Okay, so this is fairly recent. Yeah. And so then you... That's that's how I would see it. Right. Um, obviously, I was having shows and doing some stuff before then. Sure, but yeah. I relate to that because I feel like I've started four or five times. And each time I start, I have to like run into a wall and then start over again. And each time I feel like the start over was the beginning. The other times didn't count. To yeah. some degree, you know, like I've been making photographs since the year. What does the starting point do? Like, how, how do you know it's a new starting point? Like, what, what for do you me, think it is that? It's, it's, it's erasing the back catalog, and I don't mean it erasing it from my head, but erasing it as, as relevant, as presentable. And like, work I made then is just not good enough. And when I finally cross the hump, like I can sit there with a body of work and be like, I'm going to have a show, I'm going to present this, and the, 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 the start over is when I look at it all and go, this is going in the drawer. This was important, but it's useless right now in terms of like mm. getting a but, show, moving it I, out you there. Might, you might be surprised how useful that all becomes. I'm, I'm saving it for yeah. that. I'm sa definitely saving it for that, but it has happened that I've like work on a project, work really hard, um, you know, tear my heart out on it, finish it, shop it around a little bit and then be like, you know what? It's just not good enough. I'm yeah. just canning it. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many factors and it's quite a personal thing. Well, I think for me, it helps me get better. It's part of this debate we were talking yeah. about earlier, this personal debate you have to have with yourself about the value of what you do. Yeah. It's also, I think, uh, um, it's about the rhythm of process. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, you have to be doing to enough that. of it that um, you need to you're able to make ruthless too. choices. I mean, you know, 
one of my lecturers in art school, you know, said <laughs> Matisse could make 75 drawings a day. How many drawings did you make today? Right. And I'd be like, I don't know, I made three or four centimeters of this drawing today. <laughs> and you just, you know, kind of turn around and, and I mean, not to say that um, Some tough love. important to, uh, to churn out work, but what he was getting at was that not everything you make has to be an end point. Mm -hmm. In fact, very little of what you make is an end point. And mm -hmm. most, of, most of what you make is a stepping stone to the next thing you make. Exactly. And that um, the best way to work it all out is by doing it, by starting with the thing you know and adding it, changing it, pushing it closer and further in the directions to where your interests are, taking each step, you know, and pushing it. But you have to kind of, in order to make the kind, you know, some of the lateral jumps and the sort of um, more uh, dramatic swoops to the to new places, right? you have to be taking lots of steps and, and, and making lots of critical decisions. And, and leaving hard some on things yourself. behind. Of course, leaving a lot behind. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that was valuable to me, especially young, because I, I still work very, very slowly. Um, but I'm reasonably disciplined about making sure there's a certain amount of thinking, even though, you know, right now I'm working full time here in Denmark and my art practice is a bit distracted. I'm still spending a certain amount of time every day completely focused on the project of where my art practice is moving to and from, whether that's right. concrete projects I've got in the works for the future or whether that's just my ongoing push to try and explore different things and well let's talk about now because you know here you are you're here because i wouldn't say through no choice of your own but you're here through a a series of events that mm -hmm. led you here which wasn't necessarily your own um but you've taken to it like a duck to water you seem to be really enjoying your time here um you have we got to be sure to plug you have an artwork right now at the uh, Esbjerg Art Museum, which yeah, was completely serendipitous that that happened. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good, it was a good opportunity that came. Uh, I don't know. Uh, some people talk about this stuff like, you know, that you, you make your own luck and there's all these kind of quips about that. I, I never know any of that, but um, it's really, I just felt really lucky. Um, yeah that they'd uh, seen my work in fact they contacted me thinking that i was in australia and um wanted me to send this drawing machine that i'd built <laughs> in 2009 um over to this exhibition that they were curating uh, in esbia you know this kind of industrial port town of of, of, of jutland right and uh, i thought that was bizarre i was like well look that work's kind of packed up and gone and you know, I've only got part of it and that part of it's like in my mum's studio back in Melbourne, right. you know. But guess what? I'm in Copenhagen. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, stupidly uh, and with no time and no money, we, uh, yeah, put the heads down and um, and made a new drawing machine for, for the show. Um, and, and how long wait, how long is the show up for? Uh, it's up until uh, the 12th of January. What's the so name of the show? Quite a good length of time. Uh, it's called What Are You Doing Here? What Am I Doing Here? What Am I Doing Here? What Am I Doing Here? Um, which is, uh, it's curated by uh, a little England-based um, artist, uh, Nina Saunders, and a uh, philosopher, psychoanalyst uh, Ernesto Spinelli. Uh, they've co-curated it as part of a um, a series of shows um, uh, called uh, based around um, this very broad idea of art and context, but, mm -hmm. which basically means uh, introducing people into the curatorship field that aren't directly curators, both artists and professionals in kind of parallel areas I like this um, idea and it's it's great I mean Esbjerg Museum I can't speak highly enough of them they've been incredible um, supportive and, and very they seem to have a really progressive idea about um, really trying to make um, the experience of going to a gallery as open and engaging for as many different kinds of people as possible uh, and as far as I can tell um, that doesn't usually equate to watering it down 
So I, I, I think that. I think there's real ways to do it. It's just uh, having a good understanding of, of of perception and how people respond to things. And I've heard that, that they're well regarded mm. uh, in the art world. What's next? You're unfortunately leaving us soon, and we're very sad about this. Thanks, I speak Max. on the uh, behalf of all of Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> We'd really like it if you'd stay here. Thanks, man. Look, um, I hope I'll be able to come back. Um, yeah, we've had I've had some pretty good. Uh, I've had a great experience here. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Both the people and the place, and um, starting to get to know a little bit uh, the art world, um, seeing shows here, and. Yeah, feeling getting to meet some really cool artists here, both through the exhibition um, and uh, working at the Staten's Werkstelle. These kinds right, of things, right. they've been like just, there's some really great resources here for artists. And I know that um, it's not always the case that you have opportunities to benefit from them. It's, but uh, by comparison to Australia, the resources behind <laughs> most of the art world, uh, certainly the public side, um, seems phenomenal. I'm very impressed by that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a pretty exceptional system in a lot of ways. It's closed, but once you, if you can work something out, it's really, really warm and open. Mm. And, you know, it's just, you know, they'll really put their weight behind you. They'll support you and mm. what you want to do. Yeah. Well, it feels like that. I mean, I'm only just starting to get a sniff of it. But yeah. um, what's next? Um, well, uh, I'm currently developing a uh, quite a big site-specific installation, outdoor installation for the Sydney Biennale, mm. um, which is a reasonably large uh, arts festival in Australia. Um, and uh, that's mostly what I'm working on. I've been uh, doing some drawings uh, for a show. I'm kind of hoping I'll pitch to bring me back here uh, yeah but uh That's what i'm talking about we're uh we're probably a little way off uh right doing that um but the the build for sydney is uh considerable it's a 75 meter installation are you allowed um, to tell us what it is uh i can tell you it's sort of i can tell you about it i'm not supposed to really tell you anything but who cares um <laughs> It's uh, it's only going on the internet. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's um, it's ba it's a project based around. Uh, it, well, I should tell you that the, the festival's located mostly on a place called Cockatoo Island, which is a small uh, uh, island with a very mixed history, but in most recent times has kind of uh, been a shipbuilding and um, kind of industrial. It's a very small island in the, in the middle of Sydney Harbour in central Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, and for the past 50 years, it's been, or oh, might have that date wrong, uh, cared for by the National Trust um, and in more recent times been used for big events um, such as the Biennale and uh, some others such as I've forgotten. Um, also been a great site for, uh, for filmmakers and, and shooting films, uh, both locally and international films, hmm. uh, because it's just got some incredible, uh, old industrial architecture and old shipbuilding equipment, which is half dilapidated. And it's got, you know, quarried kind of cliff face hill with a tunnel running through it. And there's all these kind of haunted spaces and, um, sounds pretty strange interesting things. Anyway, I was really inspired by uh, when I started thinking about the project, um, about making something ruinous, uh, making a kind of a, a lived-in space, a space for, for dwelling or the traces of, of dwellings, um, mm -hmm. something that would indicate um, a kind of past civilization or imply that, but in its ruined state, form a new function. Part of what I was asked to do was to activate this long kind of concrete area of the what they call the East Apron. Um, but that's kind of turned into uh, something which perhaps um, has been quite influenced by uh, the, uh, the earth mounds and um, burial sites of, of the north, actually, mm. um, and the kind of uh, megalithic history of northern European cultures, not only, but, but that's wow. been my main experience. So... Um, yeah, one of the main components is a uh, kind of 
um, burial mound meets um, minimal sculpture on mass kind of turf tunnel uh, mega structure. I guess. Are you working alone or are you working with other people? Uh, they, I mean, obviously, there's more people involved, but are you given a certain space to work individually on? Yeah, that's okay. um, that's kind of how it works. Uh, there's lots of different artists, uh, obviously, as part of the Biennale, and um, probably one of the youngest and riskiest <laughs> as far Man, as they're concerned. Yeah. Um, but they're, uh, but um, the current curator, Julian Amberg, is... Uh, yeah, she's one of the really um, strong um, and informed voices in Australian contemporary art. I mean, yeah. She's How'd been, that come about? Uh, she um, came to see um, a series of three uh, improvised shelters I built in a urban renewal area in central Melbourne as part of the Next Wave Festival in 2012, okay. um, which were built from um, building waste from the sort of... Um, ongoing kind of uh, high-rise development that goes on around that area and it's been a, a, a kind of um, infamous uh, sort of failed metropolis uh, in the old port district of, of inner Melbourne which is really very close to the center of the city so it's, it's basically um, a continuation of it um, but for various sort of uh, developmental reasons and government decisions is been widely condemned both by the sort of architecture planning community and by the general public um, in terms of just really not being welcoming and uh, hmm. it's got a, it's, it was a very interesting site then to make sort of vernacular structures which were in very high contrast to the sort of slick steel and glass architecture that's so isolating about the place um, anyway and, and, and so it grew out of uh, some discussions we had um, at the at the shelters um, that's yeah, great. and she was kind enough to uh, invite me and take the risk to to let me be involved. Um, but of course, uh, I'll be working with a really. I'm already working with a really great team from the Biennale itself, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, I'm sure that's going to flesh out more and more. Uh, the more hands on I get uh, in early December. When's that happening? The uh, opening? I think the opening date is the 24th of March. So I'm kind oh, of going back. Okay to Australia to spend the summer um, in residence in Sydney um, at Artspace um, and working, building the installation along with the team on Cockatoo Island for the three months. Uh, okay, sort so of January come to March. June next year, you'll be back here, something like that. Uh, yeah, look, um, I'd love to make it back in time for next summer if, 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 if next summer is any, if this summer is any indication. Oh, yeah, it's never an indication here. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they say. Yeah, well, we, it sounds like we've been spoiled. Yeah. It was very nice. All right, well, do you want to tell the people how to find you? A little uh, bit of plug here, a little website, something like yeah, that? Um, yeah, you can check out uh, josephlgriffiths.com. Yeah, we'll put a link up to um, Sure, that would be nice. Uh, any feedbacks, good feedback. Yeah, tell him his art isn't art. He likes that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, yeah. uh, thanks for the chat, man. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. I appreciate it too. Yeah. Right? How about that? How about that man's mind? How about his intelligence? How about his thoughtfulness? I personally just really enjoyed talking to Joseph, and I really enjoyed the way he thinks about things. I know I've said it about 15 times, but that's really the thing that strikes me about him. Uh, he has a thoughtfulness and, a, and especially a kind of earnestness uh, in the way he sees things, but without the naivete. Uh, I think earnestness and naivete often go together. There's a thin line between the two of them. But, uh, you know, I think the key really is if you can go through this life and retain your curiosity, your interest, your thoughtfulness, and your earnestness without becoming cynical or without having your naivete shattered and instantly turned into cynicism or whatever you know seems to happen in the world then i think you're winning or at least you're off to a really good uh, a really good start so um to everybody keep it up to joseph keep it up so hi to australia and um we're gonna miss you buddy um i hope you're doing well i think uh 
you are still part of your epic 29-hour flight back to Australia. Man, can you guys imagine? That's got to be the worst thing about living in Australia is every time you go anywhere except for New Zealand, I guess, it takes hours. I mean, I bitch and moan about having to fly to America. That only takes like 12 or 14 hours, depending on whether you have a layover or not. And that's to San Francisco from here. Holy cow, 29 hours. Three flights, 29 hours. You, sir, are a hero. We salute you here in Copenhagen. Well, at least you're going home to summer, right? We're getting the winter here. So uh, enjoy your uh, your warm-ass Christmas. Boy, that's weird, too. Summer and Christmas. Those things just don't seem to go together. Anyways, that's today's show. I want to thank you guys for listening once again. We are moving forward. Nothing else to say about that. Interstitial music was provided by The Insider once again, because that guy kicks ass. Check them out. Link on the show notes page. And our intro and outro music is as forever and always provided by Heavy Links. So uh, check them out. There's also a link on our about page. That's about uh, that's about it. Holler on Twitter. Holler on our email, which is holler at undergang.net. And that about does it. Next week, we're going to talk to a performance artist. Can you guys guess who that might be? We'll see. All right. Bye, guys.